<clears throat> Thank you very much, Molly. And um, again, I would like to add to the thanks that have already been expressed to the uh, organisers of this conference and on a personal note, the very kind invitation uh, to be here. So uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Um, I'm a little like uh, Duncan um, in that I had, well, I had a, a, you know, a written, written paper and I, I rewrote it during the first session because I was um, so stimulated by the wonderful panel uh, this morning and then listening to the two previous uh, presentations I rewrote it again um, as I was scribbling, scribbling down there. Um, I come with uh, a suggestion for a research agenda and I'm calling uh, this, this research agenda humanizing uh, copyright. Um, and I'll explain uh, what I mean uh, by that um, in a moment. I think it has substantive and also systemic uh, aspects. Uh, but just a, a few responses to, to some of the comments that were made earlier on uh, today. I was struck uh, by Audrey Chapman's comment that uh, you know, we, the, we need details in terms of how the relationship between the two areas of law uh, should play out. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely uh, correct. Um, and, and I think we also need uh, um, greater specificity in terms of the policy salience of human rights in this space and how they fit together. Um, but I, I want to pick up also on uh, Duncan's uh, challenge, uh, which is, well, what happens if we uh, look at copyright in particular uh, through a natural rights um, lens? Um, and as he uh, discussed briefly uh, today, there is a human rights basis uh, for doing so. Uh, and that's in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 15.1c uh, on the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. We put up the text um, later. Um, but in, in essence, those documents uh, guarantee to everyone the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he is the author. Um, now, some years ago, I... Uh, co-authored a paper where I suggested that policymakers uh, should take account of uh, the human rights of uh, creators in uh, policy deliberations about uh, copyright. Um, I know that policymakers uh, anxiously, and I think that's the right word, anxiously deliberate on the implications of uh, international economic law uh, in this space. But what we tried to do in the paper was invite a discussion of uh, the implications for the development of policy of the human rights of uh, creators. Um, that, uh, and Larry Helfer and I um, develop those ideas in chapter three um, of the book. Um, the, the basic point that we are addressing is, or, or raising, was that there are human rights statements, um, human rights norms that speak to uh, the moral and material interests of uh, creators. And I want to talk about what that might mean uh, for these discussions later on. Now, the original paper uh, provoked um, some stern criticism um, in, the, in the blogosphere, um, and the the, the view was advanced that the ideas that, that we were exploring was you know, yet another um, instance of uh, bringing human rights on the side of stronger copyright. Um, and this was a problem when the very purpose of invoking human rights in this space wasn't it, uh, to restrict um, or limit or constrain intellectual property. Now, I think the, the critics miss the point, but you, know, you always think that when people criticize you, they miss the point. Um, <laughs> but um, the idea uh, that I'd like to advance in the context of, of this conference is that um, instead of strengthening copyright necessarily, um, paying attention to that often neglected part of the important human rights instruments might provide us with an opportunity to do what I call humanizing uh, the rights of creative people. Um, 
And it might be a way of getting us out of the dualism, the polarization that we seem to be trapped in um, in this discussion. So what I'd like to do is um, begin some tentative suggestions of what a normative vision of authors' rights grounded in human rights uh, might uh, look like. And I suggest that it casts a strong light on the interests of uh, creative workers. Um, and the sort of part of the, the point of this is that I, I don't think that it is uh, always helpful to be antagonistic uh, towards uh, human rights claims in this space. And I think that the claims need to be disaggregated. So I was interested by Antonio's um, suggestion that we access uh, this space by focusing on copyright as part of the human right of property. We, uh, my, my point is whether or not a corporation can claim um, a uh, human rights basis for a trademark application tells us actually nothing um, about the material circumstances of creative workers um, and how those should be furthered uh, through a, a human rights, uh, sorry, how they should be improved through a human rights uh, perspective. I'm going to suggest uh, later on in the remarks that this whole space actually desperately needs more engagement uh, with this uh, humanized vision of copyright that I'm um, advancing um, here. But um, just a little bit more on the jurisprudence of the human rights of authors. As I think we all know, um, the principal source for the normative content of that right, which is nestled in amongst uh, the rights to participation in culture, the right to benefit uh, from science, is uh, General Comment uh, 17, um, which links the rights of uh, creators uh, to broader dignitary interests, um, obviously, um, the ability to secure a decent standard of living. Um, and I, I think that, as I say, that this invites a very sharp focus on the real materi the materiality of, uh, of creativity and what, how do, exactly does creativity occur, who's subsidizing it, who's paying, who's paying for it, um, who doesn't have the benefits of subsidization, um, and, and so on. But just to, um, in Larry Helfer's work, um, with his characteristic eloquence, he described, the, or summarized the jurisprudence as being concerned with a zone of personal autonomy in which people can control their productive output and lead independent intellectual lives. Now, where does this take us? And I think one of the things it does is that it encourages us um, to see that the security of authors' moral and material interests um, is or should be part of a cluster of policy responses that enable creativity to occur and imagination to flourish. I mean, it sits amongst a number of other areas of equal concern, education, freedom of expression, obviously, um, freedom of association. Um, it, but it's, it suggests that attention must be paid uh, to the broader circumstances um, in which this work uh, occurs. Um, I think it also invites uh, an analysis of the class implications um, uh, of arguments about what should or should not be uh, in, in the public domain. Um, so, so I think that that's sort of a general framing point. But if we anchor uh, create the rights associated with the creator um, in a human rights discourse, then I think it actually invites or provides us another set of arguments to see that the claim of an author in respect of a novel um, is very different uh, in terms of personal autonomy, human dignity, um, and those kinds of values than, say, an in-house corporate document, to use a famous United States example, an in-house corporate document uh, that discloses uh, critical information about faulty voting machines. Um, so uh, what I'm su suggesting um, there is that 
a, a focus on human rights invites uh, concern with the nexus between the productions of creativity um, and uh, the humans um, involved, the members of the human uh, family involved in that, the flesh and blood um, authors. In the corporate claim, it's uh, very weak. Um, of course, I think it leads to a very strong set of claims, which still have not been vindicated in all jurisdictions, about the, public, the appropriate public domain status of governmental documents, um, for instance. Um, I think it provides uh, a site of resistance to what was described uh, this morning, uh, earlier on this morning, as, as to the corporatization uh, of intellectual property. Um, so, um, some other policy concerns. Um, the humanizing agenda should also uh, encourage policies that allow creative workers to maintain uh, their, their rights. Um, it would, I think it would bolster uh, claims to wind back an over-expansive work-for-hire uh, doctrine. It would bolster claims for resistance to uh, policies that lead to the concentration um, of ownership of intellectual property. Um, and this, I, I wanted to use one example that comes up in the literature. Um, General Comment 17 uh, speaks anxiously and ambiguously about whether corporations should be the beneficiaries of the rights of authors um, expressed or articulated in these documents. And PDU has uh, uh, written very well about this as well. The general comment says, um, uh, mostly appropriately, uh, that corporations should not be the beneficiaries of these rights. And I, and I think that's probably correct. But the, another way of looking at it is if the material uh, interests of authors are going to be protected uh, and they choose, for example, a closely held corporation through which to exploit their rights, I'm not sure that raises the same kinds of problems as the giant aggregation of content uh, that we're seeing um, at the moment. Um, so um, I think that it might provide us a route through uh, some of these policy uh, conundrums. Now, the systemic aspect um, of all of this kind of goes like this. Um, engagement with the right to freedom of expression cannot uh, pretend that the human rights of creators uh, don't exist. And it, I, I've just done a... You know, they're very brief survey, but it is re the, the lack of engagement with Article 15.1c um, or, uh, or Article 27 of the Universal Declaration um, is quite interesting. Um, there, um, th there's the sense that um, fr uh, freedom of expression needs to engage with sort of copyright and provide that site of resistance or blocking. Um, but there is less uh, focus on the extent to which there needs to be uh, accommodation uh, between these two statements of, of rights within an indivisibility uh, framework. Um, so a few examples of what I mean. Um, the general comment, um, Article 21, on Article 15.1a, which, about which I'm sure we'll hear um, much after, after the lunch, lunch break, um, which concerns the right to um, participate in cultural life, um, tells us that this right is connected to Article 15.1c, the human rights um, of uh, creators, but it doesn't tell us how. Um, it admonishes WIPO and other, and this is, I think relates to Audrey Chapman's point, it admonishes WIPO and other agencies to take account of the right to, to participate in cultural life but it says very little, really nothing, about what that might involve. Um, I, and I, I think that's a gap. I think that's an instance of an absence of the specificity in the analysis um, that um, Audrey called for um, this, this morning. Um, it shares some of the same difficulties with some of the analysis we've seen from the Special Rapporteur on the from, um, promotion of the right to freedom of expression. Um, Frank LaRue's uh, 2011 report um, was um, mentioned earlier, but in the 2010 report, 
uh, there is a discussion of this point that um, Antonio uh, raised, which is the extent uh, to which uh, the right to freedom of expression needs to um, um, accommodate um, other other rights, right, rights of the rights of the parties, um, the um, uh, sort of the acceptable limitations sort of problem. Um, now, um, in the 2010 report, where it would probably be obvious uh, to engage with a human rights statement about the material interests of authors, there's very little engagement um, of um, that, that point, and it's left in a kind of there be dragons uh, kind of uh, space um, there. Um, so so neither, neither document uh, really discusses um, authors' uh, material interests. But where I think this matters is it's the very thing, it's the very site uh, where we should have engagement um, of uh, the issues. And it's the very thing that one would expect WIPO ought to want to know. Um, so analysis of street freedom of expression, in my view, would be strengthened uh, by more engagement uh, with uh, this, this topic. Um, the sort of final um, point um, that uh, I want to raise uh, in terms of this justified limitations uh, point, um, many of you will, will know the, the recent uh, decision of the European Court of Human Rights, um, the Ashley Donald case, where um, the, um, was concerned with whether the criminalization of copyright infringement is uh, permissible in uh, the light of protections for freedom of ex expression. Um, and the outcome in the case was really there's a large margin of appreciation um, in this area. We can accept um, sort of France's engagement uh, with the point. Um, and given the margin of appreciation, um, freedom of expression is going to sit alongside um, copyright because we're going to characterize copyright as a justified uh, limitation um, in this space. Um, it tells us very little um, about how the rights of authors viewed through this more humanized, softer uh, lens uh, should engage with these uh, principles. What I think uh, we need is less balance, the more accommodation uh, between uh, the, the two indivisible uh, sets of rights. So thank you for that.